Good evening. Uh, welcome to the um, Got Ancient Wisdom live stream, uh, where we're going to continue reading from this book here, which is, can you see under, under the candlelight? This is Total Man. There you go, you can see it there, Total Man by Stan Gooch, 1972 book. Um, I will be putting these up on um, all the other channels as well. So. Uh, who we've got in the in the chat? We've got our first uh, our first Twitcher, if that's what they're called. That's, to me, that's a bird watcher, and that's a uh, Revelations fourteen ninety two. Cool name. Uh, is our first Twitch follower, uh, and then the only way out is in is in the chat. Hi. Hi, the only way out is in. First of all, before I start, this is my new bookmark. So this is my old this is my old bookmark. Okay, it's a plastic bag. And this is the new bookmark. And you can see it's made of leather. I don't know if you can see it under the candlelight, probably not. See if I can put it. You can see it on my front page of my channel now, anyway. And it's um, it's it's something that the only way out is in made, and gave me. And it's got G O T A W engraved into a piece of, into a piece of leather, a lovely soft leather bookmark. So, yeah, we we could probably do them as merch at some point. Maybe. Can't see the only way out is in. Can't see anything except black. What the on the bookmark? Yeah, I, I think, I think so as well. Let me see if I've got a. Um, let me see if I can do it with a torch. All right, there's the torch. We're going. We're going. There you go. <laughs> you can just about see it now. There you go. So I can't hold it all up with, I've only got two hands. But we can see it's engraved G O T A W, got ancient wisdom. That's right. So, thanks to The Only Way Out is In for that. Now I've got something I can keep my page with properly rather than the plastic bag, which is what I had before. The plastic bag was good, but the leather bookmark is better so we'll just uh carry let's carry on with where we left off which was let me get myself let me get myself a bit comfy here i don't feel comfortable i feel like i'm I feel like i'm uh sitting in a weird position all right new candle as well oh, you're welcome the only way out is in you're welcome no well you're welcome no what do you say when someone says you're welcome my pleasure. No. Anyway, thank you. Really appreciate it. So I'm going to, I've got the bookmark here marking my page. I'm going to take it out now. There you go. Okay, so um, we're going to carry on with um, part three of Total Man, which is trance and anti-trance. And this is chapter five, aspects of Western psychology. The last bit we touched on was, where is it? It was table three in this page here, uh, page 130. And this was um, Gucci's, um, his own invention called attack mechanisms, which was the opposite of defense mechanisms. So now we're going to go on to um, attack mechanisms. 
So we can leave we can leave the table up actually. Let's leave the table up because it, this, these do apply to those to those um, that list on the table. So attack mechanisms. One, the Freudian slip or motivated error. These slips are considered by Freud to be not really mistakes, but to have a meaning to be giveaways, as it were, the tip of icebergs projecting from the unconscious. Opponents of this view argue that these slips are simply nothing more than retrieval errors of memory. The frequent external resemblance of the mistake to the correct form is stressed by the conditioning theorist. A man writing a cheque for £42 might find that he has written 42. The motivated error, or Freudian slip, proposes that the man writing the cheque, e.g. resented the expense, I wish it had been £4. To regard this as just a mistake seems perhaps in this instance to be more reasonable, but what if a man in 1970 enters the date on a cheque as 1932? Alternatively, a shy person who has been more or less dragooned into giving a public lecture says in the course of it, the point I want to strain is that is it the attitude of the speaker which has been substituted, which has substituted strain for stress, stress and strain being, of course, a common expression. The slip appears to be saying, I find this lecture a strain, which agrees rather well with the known facts. If this evidence still does not convince, what are we to make of the man who mistakes the date of his wedding? What of the woman who, noting her husband in the street, referred to him as a friend, having completely forgotten that she had been married to him for some weeks? This marriage, Freud tells us, came to a very unhappy end some years later. 2. Neurotic tiredness. This is something which most people experience occasionally. In fairly extreme cases, the individual is always too tired or unwell to go to work, too tired to entertain friends, and so on. The main observable, though not absolute, difference between neurotic and genuine fatigue is that the former can disappear or modify from one moment to the next with a change of circumstances. Psychosomatic illnesses are allied here in the sense that they are expressed simply, partly or wholly, produced by an unconscious attitude of mind or by a situation rather than by a disease. Thus, moving away from one's mother's neighbourhood might have the effect of causing a bad skin condition to disappear. So that's a um, bit of German new medicine there. Three and four, rationalisation and prejudice. Psychologists normally include rationalisation and prejudice under defence mechanisms. It is evident that this is an error. All one needs to ask is, who wins, the unconscious or the ego? In both these cases, it is fairly clear that the unconscious has effectively won. This is illustrated by a simple experiment. A subject is hypnotised in the course of a social gathering and given the post-hypnotic command to fetch his umbrella into the drawing room and open it 15 minutes after the session, and to forget that he has been instructed to do so. The subject duly does as commanded. When those present ask why he has done it, he replies matter-of-factly that he needed to see whether the umbrella had any holes. The subject is rationalising, that is, giving an apparently rational explanation for an unconscious or irrational act. 5. Major life decisions based on unconscious wishes. This phenomenon is harder to illustrate to the satisfaction of the sceptic. In all fairness, it is difficult to see how one could produce experimental evidence in its support. Examples are provided, however, by those individuals who go somewhere for a holiday for a few weeks and then astonishingly never return, but spend the rest of their lives in that hitherto strange place or by the businessman who wanders into a lunchtime lecture or evangelist meeting and is saved or converted on the spot. While this is frequently only a transitory state, it can happen that a man's or woman's life is totally, irre irrevocably altered from then on by this chance event. And chance has a question mark. It is incidentally extremely difficult even to begin to account for these particular phenomena in terms of conditioning and reinforcement schedules. And now we go on to defence mechanisms. Here, one sees the reverse side of the coin. The conscious mind 
dealing more or less successfully with libido or unconscious impulses. So we've got six, repression and denial. According to Freudian theory, any mental content is consciousness which is painful or otherwise disturbing to the conscious mind or ego may be repressed, that is, pushed down into the unconscious. The memory of this act of repression is also repressed at the same time so that the whole incident from start to finish is forgotten. This act produces at least a temporary solution to the difficulty or conflict and one that is satisfactory to consciousness. That, however, is not the end of the matter. The repressed content is said to gather energy to itself and attempts to re-enter consciousness. As it grows more powerful, more and more energy is expended by the ego in maintaining the state of repression, hence possibly neurotic tiredness. The more powerful the repressed content becomes, the more it can counter-influence conscious behaviour by such means as Freudian errors. Denial is allied but is perhaps more the refusal to consider that something external is so. A landowner might deny that his tenants were suffering when it was obvious to an outsider that there was actually very real suffering. Denial, perhaps, is the blocking of disturbing ideas seeking to enter awareness through conscious perception. See that We see that word used a lot, denial, by... Some people, deniers, they, they, they label people deniers. So they're, what they're doing when they label someone a denier is they're, they're attempting to um, they're attempting to suggest that there's something, there's, a, there's a, some sort of mental illness in, in the way that that person thinks. So number seven, projection. Appropriately placed amongst the defense mechanisms, this is a warding off a defense against system B activity. In Freud's terms, it is an attempted, attempted flight from the demands of the unconscious. The existence of the mechanism is readily demonstrated. A large number of people who know each other, say students following the same course at a given college, are asked to rate each other and themselves for meanness with money. The individuals voted by the large majority as possessing this trait not only attribute a significantly high level of meanness to all other individuals, but a low level to themselves. That is to say, the person agreed by the common consent of others to be mean does not only not see it himself, see himself as mean, but instead, by projection, finds this trait in everybody around him. 8. Reaction Formation This, as its name implies, is yet another form of denial of an inner state, by means this time of the outward display of the reverse of the internal state. Thus, an outward bully may be an internal coward. A person noted for giving his opinion loudly and at length may secretly have strong feelings of inadequacy. 9. Intellectualization. The discussion of various personal or human elements, pain, loneliness, love, in dry scientific objective terms or within academic, legal or business frameworks is a way of diffusing potential emotional explosives. It is a common device for reducing one's emotional involvement, feelings of guilt or whatever, and of denying the valid emotional rights of others. As we shall see in due course, this mechanism is rife in Western culture, as are in fact all the defence mechanisms discussed here. The matter was already touched on in Chapter 3 in connection with the Latinization of public language. An example of this all-too-powerful weapon in the hands of the intellect is that of naming the unnameable, thereby trapping or destroying it. The process is described in many fairy tales such as Rumpelstiltskin and Alibaba. In early Judaism, conversely, the name of God was not to be spoken or written down. We've seen, uh, seen that coming back again, G-O-D or G-D. Discovering the name, the magic phrase, the open sesame, both tames the phenomenon and places the power within conscious grasp. Unfortunately, unfortunately, these contents frequently arrive there dead, so fairy gold examined in the light of day becomes dross. A yet worse form is the replacement of a name by a number. There we go. This is employed in concentration camps and prisons as part of a process of dehumanization and partly to protect the guards against their own feelings. 10. Displacement. Emotion deriving from or appropriate to a particular situation felt for some reason as too threatening may be displaced to another less threatening one. 
A youngster feeling aggression against his parents may go and instead hit his smaller brother or sister or his pet dog. Experimentally, a rat can be induced to attack, say, a rubber doll in preference to another bigger and more dangerous rat. This necessarily all too brief review of unfree behaviour was undertaken partly to emphasise the existence of two basically opposed relationships with the unconscious. These are, to repeat them, an involvement with and a defence against or flight from. An extension of this basic position, incidentally, could constitute a a definition of mental illness. Both too much involvement and too strenuous a a defence constitute a hazard to mental health. An imbalance of the psychic economy leading ultimately to serious abnormality. Involvement with may, however, be on a willing or unwilling basis, and in the latter case, it is therefore better described as domination by. Willing involvement of various kinds with System B is displayed by the enthusiastically superstitious, the conventionally religious, the uncritical believer in psychoanalysis, many pacifists, many do-gooders and hordes of others. Unwilling or only partially willing involvement is displayed, for instance, by the dominated and ineffectually resentful husband, the unmarried son or daughter unable to escape from the mother, the severe neurotic nevertheless prepared to undergo a long and painful psychoanalysis in order to become free. Conversely, defence against, so clearly displayed in psychosis, as we shall see later, differs from unwilling involvement with, in the sense that the defence against situation though demonstrably unfree has been established in some sense on the individual's own terms as opposed to someone else's he has so to speak chosen his own poison he cannot be said to be free of the influence of his unconscious but he is fighting a grim and at least partially successful rearguard action this individual is as it were prepared to cut away the rigging in order to remain afloat or risk burst in the sails in order to continue to run before the wind. Or we could say that he has retreated to his castle within which, despite the barbarian hordes without, he enjoys a measure of security and exercises a measure of self-government and autonomy. It is only that he has cut himself from the surrounding natural countryside, that is, from warm, affectional and spontaneous relationships, from the experience of meaning as opposed to significance, which are his birthright. His sole remaining contact with it must then take the form of brief armed forays, protected by his intelligent contempt and his sterilised scalpels under the banner of his university degree. (laughs) <laughs> it's a, this, this basically a description of uh, of uh, people in the West at the time and some people now I guess the, the sort of like the elites have taken that whole that whole uh, thing to an extreme uh These analogies are possibly over emotive or perhaps not emotive enough. A fuller discussion of the further ramifications of the defence against position is best kept, however, for the detailed consideration of psychosis. Before closing the discussion of Freudian psychoanalysis, a word must be said of the mechanics of dreaming, since this is such an important part of Freud's theory. The dream, in Freud's view, is essentially a fantasy wish fulfilment expressed in fantasy or symbolic form. And this holds true, he maintains, also for unpleasant, even horrifying dreams. Here, the wish is disguised. The dream is also, in a sense, a message from the unconscious to consciousness about the general state of the nation, and in particular, the need of the libido. Most of the requirements of the libido are unacceptable to the ego, however, especially in latter life after many years of social training. It is for this reason, according to Freud, that the libido dresses up and disguises the dream. What we recall on waking is the disguised so-called manifest dream. Dream analysis, associative and symbolic interpretation, breaks the code and reveals the true so-called latent dream, the dream's real meaning. Much of the manifest dream can be shown to be made up from waking experiences of the previous 24 hours, people one has met, remarks one has heard, and so on. 
Moreover, pinpricks experimentally administered to a sleeping individual or drops of water on the forehead may be immediately incorporated into an ongoing dream. Most people occasionally experience the fortuitous incorporation of knocks on doors, alarm clocks ringing, and so forth. The fundamental error of the experimental psychologist engaged in attacking the Freudian view of dreams has been to base the attack solely on the manifest dream, e.g. by causing the kinds of incorporations we have just mentioned to occur under experimental conditions. The Freudian view is based quite explicitly on the latent dream, on its associational and symbolic value. Freud does not deny that water experimentally dropped on the forehead may be incorporated into dreams. He asks instead why every individual incorporates it differently. One dream he is drowning in a river, another one dreams that he is drowning in a river, another that he has found an oasis in the desert, a third that he is being tortured by Indians. Freud's view that the manifest destiny the <laughs> <laughs> They're talking about tortured by Indians. Freud's view that the manifest dream is an evasive smokescreen or a sop to the prudery of the conscious mind seems to me somewhat overcomplicated, however. It is, not, is it not simpler and more in line with other observations made of the unconscious of System B to propose that the disguised nature of the dream is an accident, that is, the dream that dreams are that way because it is in their nature to be so? On this view, the products of the unconscious are symbolic, obliquely expressed and associative, because these happen to be the characteristics of that system. In the same way, the mysterious utterances of the Delphic Oracle and other diviners and soothsayers would not be intentionally so in the way that the conscious mind understands intention any more than it is a Russian's intention to be mysterious when he speaks Russian. As already pointed out, Freud himself, however, supported the view of the deliberate concealing encodement and of the unconscious material by the unconscious. Freud has stated the ego to be under the control of the reality principle. This view is acceptable to the present argument. Freud's further declaration that libido is ruled by the pleasure principle, hence dreams are wish fulfillments, and indeed many Freudian errors contain a hidden wish, is not, however, acceptable unless it is clearly understood to, to apply only to the sexual instinct and not to the whole of the unconscious. In this connection, nevertheless, it is interesting and apposite to recall the behaviour of the rat with the electrode embedded in one of the pleasure centres who spent all of his waking hours activating the electric current. Would one consider that the experimental psychologist had liberated the rat's libido from the restraining influence of his ego? However, the pleasure principle cannot serve the argument of this book as an adequate description of the principle governing system B. Some other principle will have to be sought, though this will need to incorporate the pleasure principle at least as a subcase. At this point, we end our consideration of Freudian psychology. The analytic theories of Jung too are postponed for more appropriate consideration elsewhere. 3. The relation of conditioning and learning theories to psychoanalysis. There exists at present no answer to this to the question which of the two main persuasions of modern psychology, the psychoanalytic or the experimental, has produced or will produce in the long run the better description of the human psyche. At present, it appears to the outsider, to the person that is not committed a priori, and therefore probably for not wholly reasonable reasons to the position that either of these approaches is the only approach possible, a case of match draw. To myself, as one such outsider, it seems obvious that the evidence offered by each faction will never wholly be explained away, least of all by the opposing faction. Nor does the reason for this view lie merely in the simple differences of methodology and terminology of the two factions. It is my view that each has hold of a different and equally important approach to the investigation of personality, in each case deriving from different aspects of the personality itself, since where else could they derive from? The nature and modes of functioning of which differ along the kinds of line continuously suggested by this book. The very existence of the two major persuasions of psychology under discussion itself gives support to this view. 
However, avoiding for the moment the ultimate confrontation with this central proposal, let it, let it instead be asked whether there exists an area of behaviour where the two approaches in question have met, as it were, head on, and where the outcome appears to be a partial victory for both. There exists such an area. It is that concerned... It is that concerned with the identification of stimuli and the processes of stimulus association. The stimuli being, in this case, words, presented briefly under experimental conditions such that both straightforward, i.e. retrieval errors, and Freudian errors can occur. Regarding association, experimental psychology has unfortunately demonstrated its usual penchant for gathering large numbers of facts without having much idea what to do with them once gathered. Table 4 provides an example of this. Let's find Table 4. One second, everybody. Uh, is that Table 4? I think that's Table 4, yeah. Table 4 provides an example of this. The data in question was gathered by a number of psychologists at the beginning of the century. So far, no real explanations have been forthcoming either in respect of this or of large amounts of similar material. The precise makeup of the sample groups involved is unfortunately not known. Considering these results in passing, however, it is clear that children very seldom give what one might call the logical opposite of the stimulus word as a response, whereas adults frequently do. Men in industry, in a certain sense masculine men, give this opposite noticeably more often than a group of less masculine men, or at any rate than a group of women. The average group frequency of 1,000 individuals for responding with an opposite over the whole list, only part of which is reproduced in Table 4, is four children, 43, for men and women mixed, 298, and for men in industry, 473. Thus children, both male and female, are inclined not to see the world in terms of direct opposites. A mixed group of men and women, and therefore presumably women in particular, are much less inclined than a group consisting solely of men to see the world in such terms. There is thus some case for considering children as more related in this aspect of behaviour to women than to men to the female rather than the female principle. No, to the female rather than to the male principle. Experimental psychology, as noted, has no incisive comment to make on this data. Regarding the view of personality proposed by this book, however, the data seems supportive of the general position we have taken up and further reference will be made to it in due course. Reverting to the proposed discussion of stimulus recognition and stimulus association, psychoanalysis has always maintained that taboo and similar words, i.e. swearing, colloquial names of parts of the body and so on, are avoided because of their relationship to repressed and or forbidden mental content and wishes. Jung, in particular, held that attitudes or reactions to certain words provided clues to unconscious conflicts or complexes. One of the prime difficulties which has always faced the psychoanalyst is that of gaining access to the unconscious. Dreams provide one avenue, free association as it is termed another. The latter, in favour of which Freud abandoned hypnosis, consists of persuading a patient to say whatever comes into his or her head, however irrelevant, irreverent or inconsequential it may seem, in connection with topics suggested by the analyst. Jung narrowed this technique down to the practice of giving single words to which the patient had to make a single word response, as in the data of Table 4. So Table 4, uh, associ associate, associational response made to a verbal stimulus by three groups. Um, strange three groups, really, if you think about it. A thousand children, a thousand men and women, and a thousand men in industry. So, yeah, I guess that's... As Stan put it, it's um, masculine men. Yeah, that's an, it's an interesting one that they would do that. I mean, um, I'm just trying to get uh, one sec. I'm just trying to get the uh, window up for 
you for uh, YouTube. Oh, that's it, got it up. Right. Um, and then we've got table, eat and chair, dark, night and light, man, work and woman, deep, whole and shallow, soft, pillow and hard. So even the men in industry, out of a thousand, only eight of them responded to the word man with work. They, the, the, over half of them responded to the word man with woman. That's quite an interesting one. Uh, and then soft. <laughs> The uh, 548 out of 1,000 responded with hard. That's quite interesting as well. Hard men. Okay, where were we? Sorry, I had to do a yawn, off, off, off mic yawn. Sorry about that. While all the features of the responses which Jung considered significant, need not concern us here. Some of these are an unusually long pause in making an association, blushing, speaking softly or mumbling, and other displays of embarrassment, a misheard or misunderstanding of the stimulus word, failure to recall the original response in a second run through. When any of these indicators are present, they are taken as evidence of an emotional disturbance or conflict. You could most of them you can associate. You could most of them you could use in every in every conversation you have, or with a politician, or anything like that. So, uh, a long pause, um, speaking softly or mumbling. Uh, uh, what is the other one? Um, a mishearing or misunderstanding of the stimulus word. So you see that a lot with politicians where they say, oh, I'm sorry, what was that? And that gives them time to, obviously gives them time to a bit of think, to, to think for a bit, but it also indicates that there's probably some sort of conflict there. In the general context of the experimental study of reaction times, a device called a tachistoscope, tachistoscope, simply... A modified slide projector projects images or printed words onto a screen for predetermined fractions of a second. There is an exposure time, which varies from individual to individual, termed a threshold, below which the stimulus cannot be identified by the subject. Among the many factors which can raise or lower a subject's threshold, one is the nature of the word itself. That is to say, some words are identified and not others at one and the same exposure time. With the exposure time set just above the subject's previously determined threshold, such tachistoscopic projection demonstrates clearly that many individuals fail to see taboo words like fuck, etc. and anxiety arousing words, e.g. vagina, menstrual, while identifying ones like house, gramophone and so forth. But the changes in skin conductivity registered when these other words appear show that they have indeed been recognised at some level. There is no suggestion, however, that the subject is consciously lying. Critics of such demonstrations argue that taboo words were far less often seen and heard than most words. That is, in effect, they have undergone a very different, less intensive schedule of reinforcement during the subject's lifetime. Experiment show, showed that neutral words which occurred with roughly the same frequency as the impolite words in the spoken and written media, such as diaton, prole, etc., earned the same lack of recognition when given the same exposure time as taboo words. In association tests, these rare words also produced delayed responses, forms of uneasiness, etc., there are a number of points here. First, it is likely that many of these 
unfamiliar words arouse similar reactions to taboo words because the person suspects that that is what they are. If this seems far-fetched, let us remember the use of such words in comedy shows and farce precisely to obtain this very effect. She asked to see my testimonials and so on. Possibly the subject is also put out by his failure to understand the word and so on. Yeah, I'd say that. Third, and more importantly, it is hard not to be impressed by the clear associational evidence from the lie detector of knowledge of a crime on the part of an individual who denies having such knowledge, but who is subsequently by some independent means proved to be the criminal and who meantime reacts appropriately on the detector to words associated with the misdeed. In respect of the findings discussed here, the typical situation has arisen in which A, the psychoanalysts and their supporters deny that the alternative findings of the experimentalists in any way invalidate their views on the significance of taboo and other index words vis-a-vis unconscious conflict, and B, the experimental psychologist claims to have demolished the psychoanalytic case. The overall picture is naturally rather more complex and confused than this single review suggests. It's perfectly possible to retain a single-minded psychoanalytic or a single-minded experimental view of the results in word recognition and word association without losing the respect of one's colleagues, depending, of course, on who these colleagues are. In other words, many psychologists on both sides of the fence steadfastly refuse to look through the Galilean telescope of their opponents for fear, possibly, of what they might see. 4. Psychosis In this section, we shall look in more detail at the mentally abnormal states of psychosis and schizophrenia. Both these terms refer to the same broad area of deviant behaviour, but the first is the more general, that is, while all schizophrenics are psychotics, not all psychotics are schizophrenics. Each is a blanket term covering wide ranges of mad behaviour. There is some tentative agreement on more sharply defined categories within these very broad divisions, but on the other hand, the patients themselves rarely oblige by conforming to or remaining within the category assigned to them. Many psychotics display a wide diversity of symptoms, or what they what they call now a uh, spectrum <laughs> when they're talking about autism. Autism is just psychosis. Um, I do not seek to deny the real or theoretical differences between forms of psychosis, but this is not my... Oh, hang on. Did I misread read that? I do not seek to deny the real or theoretical differences between forms of psychosis, but this is not my primary concern, nor were such differences our concern earlier when neurosis was considered. What basically concerns us here is the distinction between neurosis and psychosis as a whole. That these broad divisions represent two fundamentally differing conditions is the view of many, though not all, psychologists. As far as the present book is concerned, the neurotic is to be seen as the prisoner or victim of his autonomic nervous system, of system B as a whole, and in particular of the kind of classical conditioning to which he was subjected as a child. The psychotic, however, is viewed as one sort or another of fugitive from his autonomic system. These and other possible aspects of psychosis are described here with particular reference to the writings of R.D. Lang and with some detailed reference also to a case study by Bruno Bettelheim. On first encountering this material, the general reader may be surprised to hear mad patients talked about as if they were in some sense sane and exercising in their astonishing world at least on occasion a kind of volition. And it remains true that the views expressed by the two writers named are not the views of every psychiatrist, particularly those of the older schools. The views of Lang and Bettelheim are, nevertheless, among the most advanced of our times and currently gaining wide acceptance. Before proceeding, one point of method adopted here and maintained now throughout subsequent chapters requires clarification. In the literature on personality and mental health, two terms occur frequently, which refer to the overriding unity or to the centrally integrative forces of the personality. 
These terms are ego and self. There is unfortunately no generally recognised or consistent difference of usage respecting them. Even where one author is himself consistent, this does not carry over to other authors. The convention observed from now on is as follows. The term ego is used to refer to the experience of oneself that is associated with waking consciousness and the conscious personality. The term self, we shall avoid defining too closely at this stage, but fairly obviously it will have links with and related to the unconscious side of the mind. Where necessary, the usage of other authors will be amended in the sense that the appropriate translation will be inserted in square brackets after the term used by the other author. This is not, of course, de designed to alter what that writer is saying, but to enable an orientation to be maintained to the present book. Lang's basic premise is that psychosis is the pathological form, the exaggerated version of the condition experienced by most human beings occasionally, difficult to describe, but which gives the feeling that one has become somehow detached from one's body or from external events, for instance, in the course of serious accidents or during some other great stress or shock, namely dissociation. He suggests, amongst other things, that some individuals are more predisposed to this experience than others, undergoing it more often and more strongly. In Lang's own words, quite apart from these ordinary people who feel in moments of great stress partially dissociated from their bodies, there are individuals who do not go through life absorbed in their bodies, but rather find themselves to be, as they have always been, somewhat detached from their bodies. It is with certain of the consequences of this basic way in which one's own being can be become organised within itself that this book will be principally concerned. This split will be seen as an attempt to deal with a basic underlying insecurity. In some cases, it may be a means of effectively living with it or even an attempt to transcend it. But it is also liable to perpetuate the anxieties it is in some measure a defence against and it may provide the starting position for a line of development that ends in psychosis. This last possibility is always present if the individual begins to identify himself too exclusively with that part of him which feels unembodied. The process of becoming more disembodied is then an attempted solution to an unspecified problem or problems, problems which by definition involve the body or some aspect of it, since it is from the body that flight is taken. As one sees from the next extract, Body turns out to mean, really, feelings. The quotations are taken from the case study of Bruno Bettelheim, of a nine-year-old schizophrenic notable for believing himself to be a machine, which depended for its functioning on a number of other machines. Joey, uh, oh, so this is uh, Bruno Bettelheim, a quote from his book. I'm not sure whether he's American or something or probably what you think he is. Joey was convinced that machines were better than people. Once when he bumped into one of the pipes in our jungle gym, he kicked it so violently that his teacher had to restrain him to keep him from injuring himself. When she explained that the pipe was much harder than his foot, Joey replied, that proves it. Machines are better than the body. They don't break. They're much harder and stronger. Joey had created these machines to run his body and mind because it was too painful to be human. Reared by his parents in an utterly impersonal manner, he denied his own emotions because they were unbearably painful. He wanted to be rid of his unbearable humanity, to become completely automatic. Needless to say, this solution to the problem, the divorce of mind and body, or feeling and body, does not turn out as planned, in Lang's words. The self, ego, then seeks by being unembodied to transcend the world and hence be safe. But a self ego, is liable to develop which feels it is outside all experience and activity. It becomes a vacuum. Everything is there, outside, nothing is here, inside. Moreover, the central dread of all that is there, of being overwhelmed, is potentiated rather than mitigated by the need to keep the world at bay. This, in fact, defines the essential dilemma. The self, ego, wishes to be wedded to and embedded in the body. 
yet is constantly afraid to lodge in the body for fear of their being subject to attacks and dangers from which it cannot escape. Yet the self, ego, finds that though it is outside the body, it cannot sustain the advantages it might hope for in this position. As Lang and Bettelheim point out, the dissociation of the psychotic is not simply a temporary reaction to a specific situation of a great stress or danger, reversible when the danger has passed. It has become a fundamental reaction to all life. Moreover, it is one that is often observed already in the first months of existence, but in the patient here considered, oh, it's a quote, but in the patient here considered, they seem, in fact, to have emerged from the early months of infancy with the split already underway. And that's from Lang. Uh, another Bettelheim quote. How had Joe become a human machine? From intensive interviews with his parents, we learned that the process had begun even before birth. Schizophrenia often results from, its par from parental rejection, sometimes ambivalently combined with love. Joey, on the other hand, had been completely ignored. I, I never knew I was pregnant, his mother said, meaning she had already excluded Joey from her consciousness. His birth, she said, did not make any difference. And then uh, the only way out is in, says, this sounds like what the wealthy NWO power elites are like. I know. <laughs> That's, yeah, I, I agree. I think, that's, I think this, they, this sums them up. Precisely why this, is, this split occurs in some children and not others, even within the same family, is due probably to the interaction of any number of predisposing factors, genetic makeup, chemical imbalance, perhaps brain damage, etc., with any of a number of participating, precipitating factors, a particular relationship to parents, severe isolation, um too many changes of environment, and so on. Some of these factors possibly have both roles, and perhaps no, no one of them by itself is either necessary or sufficient cause. Of the types of family situation frequently numbered among the possible precipitating factors, one, as we just saw, is the indifferent mother, or what they call the refrigerator mom. Lang, likewise, stresses this view. The extract refers to Peter, a male patient. His parents were never openly unkind to him. They simply treated him as though he wasn't there. He was never cuddled or played with. His mother hardly noticed him at all. She had eyes only for herself. The question is how such indifference, which appears again and again in the case histories presented by Lang, leads to psychosis and schizophrenia what mental processes are actually involved. Somewhat oversimplifying, though not falsifying, the personality of the newborn infant, it can be said that the cruder and more obvious emotions are fully developed at birth, while the ego is present only in the sketchiest of forms. All will have observed babies in the grip of the most extreme rage, the whole body red with anger, as well as in similar, similarly extreme states of fear and pain. Freud said that if a baby had the strength proportionate to his rage, he would destroy the whole world and regarded the rise of civilization as following on man's ability to repress these extremes of infantile rage. The ego, which as distinct from self-awareness mediates awareness of other individuals, as well as of a physical world that is distinct from the infant and not under his direct control, is a central aspect of personality which only develops along with motor ability, intelligence and so on as the child grows up. And to an extent which is difficult to spe specify precisely and which no doubt varies from one individual to another, the ego seems also made or marred by the conditions under which it develops. Let us now recall a number of points. First, Freud's view that the ego reacts to internal danger in the same way and with the same anxiety as it does to external danger, the former being as real as the latter. Let us recall too Harlow's demonstration that a baby monkey will face danger, e.g. the drumming teddy bear, bravely and indeed will go forward to explore it, providing that it can touch the wire and cloth mother and be reassured by her physical presence. When the mother is absent from the compartment, the infant monkey crouches frozen in abject terror. 
Let us know also that many psychotic patients as children were typically never cuddled, never played with, often bottle fed, frequently ignored or left alone. Let us note finally that in work with maladjusted and disturbed children, hugging or holding them is a known method of quieting an emotional outburst. One frequently suspects, indeed, that one of the functions of the child's outburst is to force one to touch him. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, uh, and you can see now how a lot of this ties in with the autism thing. I did do a video about it, about autism and the elites. Uh, even aside from disturbed children or babies who may be somehow predisposed to anxiety, normal children often show fear of being alone or of being in the dark and of their dreams. Are these fears not clearly of the children's own manufacture, since what real harm would be likely to come to a child tucked up in its own bed, in its own house, in the next room to its parents? All children crave routine, bedtime stories and so on, structure and reassurance. These are props to the faltering developing ego. In view of all the foregoing, can one hesitate for a moment in suspecting grave developmental damage in a baby who is not merely denied even a minimal amount of normal reassurance and physical contact from its parents, but who, in addition, has some inbuilt, exaggerated sense of insecurity? It is, so, is it so unlikely that the desperate ego of such a child, as soon as it is able, will take whatever emergency measures it can in regard to its fears? Is it not likely to attempt to seal them off permanently in the way that a dam is built to keep back floodwaters or a cage built for a wild animal? How at any stage, one asks, may such a deprived child go forward to explore its own emotions, even begin to understand them, learn to control them without denying them, and at least be able to accept them as a part of himself? The second kind of mother that emerges from the case histories of psychotics is what I shall refer to as the operant mother. As contrasted with the indifferent mother, this parent is notably business-like, efficient, training-oriented. The child in the care of such a mother is unlikely to experience loneliness and anxiety to the extent just discussed. His contact with his mother, however, resembles in many ways that of an animal with its trainer. He obtains ego stimulation, but without emotion, without warmth, or possibly with a certain amount, though not necessarily as a marked amount, of, com of covert hostility and rejection. An example of such an approach to a child is provided by the mother of Julie in connection with the throwing away game, which is often played with babies by adults. In the usual form of this, of course, the baby throws the object, the rattle or whatever, and the adult retrieves it. Julie's mother, however, relates, I made sure that she was not going to play that game with me. I threw things away and she brought them back to me. Jesus. The rearing process in the hands of these mothers has a very strong resemblance to the operant reinforcement schedule of the experimental laboratory. The child does what he or she is told to do and learns what is required to learn. Spontaneous and self-initiated behaviour is, at the same time, rigorously discouraged. This is reflected in the reports of many of these psychotic patients that they were model children, always good and never any trouble. Of Julie, her mother said precisely, she always did what she was told. Lang comments that he shudders with foreboding whenever he reads such statements in the case reports of patients referred to him. He goes on. One may note that it is not unusual to find in schizophrenics a precocious development of bodily control. One is certainly often told by parents of schizophrenics of how proud they were of their children because of their precocious crawling and walking, bowel and bladder functioning, talking, giving up crying and so on. One has to ask, however, in considering the conjunction between what the parent is proud to tell about and what the child has achieved, how much of the infant's behaviour is an expression of its own will, whether the child develops a sense of being the origin of his own actions, of being the source from which his actions arise. A circus dog does not jump through a hoop because he wants to, but because you want him to. Yeah. With these statements, have we perhaps not now also found the basis for man's intense interest in and involvement with puppets, 
over so many thousands of years and in all civilizations discussed in detail in chapter 1 as one aspect of possession. That the behaviour under discussion is really operantly conditioned and does not arise simply from a reluctance or not wishing to act in any other way is shown by the remark of James, an adult patient of 28. What is called good behaviour in the child is seen in its almost nightmarish quality when compulsively displayed by the adult. For instance, his wife would give him a cup of milk at night. Without thinking, he would smile and say, thank you. Immediately, he would be overcome with revulsion at himself. His wife had simply acted mechanically and he had responded in terms of the same social mechanism. Did he want the milk? Did he feel like smiling? Did he want to say thank you? No. Yet he did all these things. And that's from Lang. Both the indifferent and the operant mother have one thing in common. They fail to feed the child's emotion or to put him in normal touch with them. In the first case, the development of the ego personality is also neglected. In the second, a kind of ego development is encouraged, but it is a controlled, subservient, conditioned ego development from which volition and self-determination are excluded. A brief word could be said here of probable differences between the neurosis-producing and the psychosis-producing mother, or, of course, family. The neurosis-producing mother is likely, for instance, to be an extremely emotional, hysterical or histrionic personality, in contrast to the marked coolness or objectivity of the psychosis-inducing parent. The former may well love her child too much. She may spoil him, smother him with affection, indulge in too much physical contact of a not particularly healthy kind, for instance, by allowing him to share her bed up to adolescence. Or she may hate the child, not the covert rejection of the psychotic mother, but an obvious open dislike or worse. The hatred, like the love, will be physical. The mother may often strike the child, feed it roughly, even tie it up or lock it in a room. Unlike the indifferent mother, this parent, from her side, has a clear neurotic involvement with the child. In all the cases cited, the child, the child of the neurosis-inducing mother enjoys two great advantages. That's enjoys in quotes. He observes emotion in someone else and he has his own emotions stimulated. These, of course, are likely to go unsatisfied in any real sense. They will be incorrectly associated and their expression may, be, may earn him a good deal of pain and punishment, but at least they are there. Hate is almost as good as love in the prevention of psychosis. This surprising statement is borne out by the patients themselves. The following are the words of a 26-year-old psychotic Joan. This is from Lang. It is possible to be beaten up or killed because no one ever does that to you unless they really care and can be made really upset. If you hate, you don't get hurt. If you hate, you don't get hurt so much as if you love, but still you can be alive again, not just cold and dead. I kept asking you to beat me because I was sure you could never like my bottom, but if you could beat it, at least you would be accepting it in some sort of way. Then I could accept it and make it part of me. The child, who is later to become psychotic, it seems, has erected temporary or permanent barriers of one kind or another against his feelings, also represented by the body and body functions, against the unconscious. These, however, prove to be inadequate at times of great emotional or other stress and in the long run altogether. Interestingly, we use the term breakdown for this kind of time of failure. In a sense, the pre-psychotic walks in fear of his own and other people's feelings. This suggests another reason why this child cannot risk being disobedient. The consequences are too unpredictable. Unlike the normally, abnormally, peaceable and diligent pre-psychotic, the neurotic child is the source of unending inconvenience to those around him, presenting a continuous pageant of bedwetting, soiling, crying, oversleeping, insomnia, constipation, stealing, tantrums, aggression, timidity, jealousy, poor health, loss of appetite, overeating, or whatever. What is the evidence, apart from the strong theoretical position we have established, that the future psychotic is terrified of his feelings and emotions? The confirmation emerges in the course of the psychosis and during its cure. 
Uh, let me just see how much far we've got to go. I'll, I'll probably finish on these quotes then. Um, so this is another quote from Bettelheim. Uh, going to the toilet, like everything else in Joey's life, was surrounded by elaborate preventions. We had to accompany him. He could only squat, not sit on the toilet seat. He had to touch the walls with one hand, in which he also clutched frantically the vacuum tubes which powered his elimination. He was terrified lest his whole body be sucked down. And this is from Lang. No one seemed to realise that if I went back to my family, I would be sucked back and lose myself. Mrs D, a woman of 40, presented the initial complaint of vague but intense fear. Her fear was as though somebody was trying to rise up inside and was trying to get out of me. My interviews with the psychiatrist were the only place I felt safe to be myself, to let out all my feelings and see what they were really like without fear that you would get upset and leave me. I needed you to be a great rock that I could push and push and still you would never roll away and leave me. In the following extract concerning Joey, when he was getting better, we understand why going to the toilet was for him such a terrifying experience. It will be clear from this and other examples in the section that many reports of possession... Uh, uh, oh no, hang on. In the following extract concerning Joey, when he was getting better, we understand why going to the toilet was for him such a terrifying experience. Drawing his fantasies was the first step in a year-long process of, of externalising his anal preoccupations. As a result, Joey began seeing feces everywhere. The whole world became to him a mire of excre excrement. At the same time, he began to eliminate freely whenever he, wherever he happened to be. Can we doubt that Joey had secretly always thought of the world as potentially a sea of excrement into which he would be sucked down were it not for his machines, i.e. his ego in projecting? in projected and artificially enlarged form. Can one fail to suspect that all of all these psychotic patients see the emotional and autonomic side of their personalities as in some way totally devouring, overwhelming or destructive? As Joey's true ego strength grew with protracted therapy, the controls and defences could be gradually dismantled and the risk could be undergone of the world's becoming or being a mire of excrement. It may well be that all the babies have experience, experiences of the world similar to those described by adult psychotics. But in the normal course of event, that is with the implicit and explicit support of the mother and other adults who are patiently, patently not swallowed up or destroyed or driven away by the child's fantasies, but are reassuringly unharmed by them, these experiences may not be terrifying. They may in some way even be pleasurable the for example the thrill of terror it may be that only when the working through and experiencing of the fantasies and accompanying sensations is delayed because uh, beyond the appropriate time that the prospect of them becomes paradoxically increasingly more terrifying to the developing ego precisely perhaps because of its increased sense of reality uh <sighs> Yeah, it's a shame to stop it here, but because there's still quite a lot to go, so I don't really want to. It's a, it's quarter two already, so I will stop it here. Um, because it's just, I mean, this this is really this is one of my favourite parts of the book, to be honest. Um, it sort of lays out the. I think it lays out Stan Gucci's argument very well that um that the psychosis and neurosis are sort of um opposite sides of that coin um so i hope that's been i hope that's been uh oh the only way out is in this was great yeah i think so i i i i think it's one of the most exciting parts of the book to be honest it's really it's like where he really sort of starts finding his feet and uh you know and the theory starts getting a lot of grounding and it moves you have to sort of like slog through some bits like the stuff about freud you know it's he's trying to sort of lay groundwork and obviously 
at the time and he, and he's not he's not like a freudian but he's saying there's aspects of freud that are still worth you know we shouldn't just sort of chuck it all out so there's there's aspects and the and the general the general sort of um you know the general theory of of psycho psychoanalysis isn't necessarily wrong it's just that maybe their approach is wrong oh ralph hexham hi ralph got a new candle only been here for the last half hour we'll re-watch later okay cool so um with that um yeah i'm gonna uh go and uh have some sleep i think because i've been yawning a few a few i've yawned a little bit through this through this show so um you should all do the same go and go and have some sleep uh but yeah good to see everybody and hope that uh everybody watching this later enjoys it shame that we had to stop though through that one because it's <laughs> it's but it is a it's a big it's a big chapter that's all i'm just looking now it's about another there's probably about another seven pages to go so it would have meant probably going till 10 so but i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna cut off now anyway and um yeah and uh i'll see you all next week next same time next week 8 30 monday on a gmt so yeah, thanks for um thanks for coming down. Could I start earlier? The only way out is in. Could I start early? It's po I mean it's possible. I could start eight o'clock. Couldn't I? But it's you know, it's that busy Monday evening in from work and all the rest of it. Uh I have to have dinner, gym loads <laughs> it's loads of things to do on a monday so yeah i'll, I'll try i'll try and start eight o'clock yeah okay i'll try and i'll try and do that it will mean it will mean changing a few bits of text letting letting the three other people know who tune in Eight thirty on the dot yeah very funny why don't people ever do things in fifteens, like eight fifteen, or like or like five past? Like I see you all at five past eight, or ten to ten past eight. It's always a half hours or hours. I don't know why. It's a bit. It's a bit uh, it is a bit autistic in itself. So uh, eight thirty on the dot. Maybe. I, I mean, I could. Do, I could. What I could do is I could start the stream at eight o'clock. Rather than eight forty five, yeah, very funny. Yeah. Well, but Ralph Hexham would have only caught fifteen minutes of it if I'd have done it at exactly the right time. Anyway, anyway. I'll uh we we'll, cause we're only delaying the end now. Fun fact, Bristol used to be fifteen minutes ahead of GMT. I never I never knew that, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fun fact so maybe we'll do it um what and what would that have been called then b bmt bristol mean time anyway listen i'll see you all next week um yeah, and we'll continue. I'll probably I'll probably go back over some of the stuff and then start reading again because it's just so interesting. All right. Good to see everyone. And uh bye-bye. <laughs>